recording now. Let's see if it's, yes, it is recording. Um, so I just want to introduce our dietitian, spelled with two T's, which was news to me, uh, even though I'm a former librarian, I didn't spell that one right. Uh, Sophia is going to uh, do a, a presentation and then she's gonna be around to answer your questions. As I mentioned before, this is uh, being recorded. Uh, so those who were not able to make it will be able to catch up on it later. Does anybody have any questions before we begin? All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Sophia then and I'm gonna mute myself. And I may okay. mute some of you depending um, <laughs> until question time, depending on how everything goes. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining today. This is awesome. I'm excited to speak to you all and Hopefully soon enough, we can have more of these engagements in person, but we'll, we'll do it this way for the time being. And I do have a little presentation. As all of you may or may not know, March is National Nutrition Month. And so I am presenting in celebration of that, but also to kind of have more of that interaction with you all, because I think through the pandemic, it's been tough to have our, our usual meet and greets and I'm still relatively new here or at least it feels like even though I've been here for a while now <laughs> um, but not having the engagement with you all so I'm excited to do that with you today and I do have a presentation so I will share my PowerPoint and you all can follow along with me through that and then at the end of that I'll open up the floor for any questions. So let me go ahead and get started with that. I'll share my screen here. Can you all see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, and we'll start from the beginning. Okay, so National Nutrition Month presentation by the Hearthstone RD, that's me. A little bit about the RD. So I am a California native. I grew up in the Bay Area and I went to school, both my undergrad and graduate uh, at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which is on the Central Coast. And it's beautiful if you all have never been. I, I highly recommend you go once traveling is, is open once again. It's, it's a wonderful place. I moved out to New York to complete an 11 month long internship. It is a requirement in order to obtain the minimum of 1,200 hours of supervised practice in order to sit for my board exam. So I bounced around through a bunch of different hospital sites. I worked in the community, got some outpatient experience, really to explore the, the breadth of what nutrition can, can be in various different areas. After completing that internship, I moved over here to Washington State in March of 2020. So I've been here just over a year. And that was right before the pandemic shut down. <laughs> I settled into the Hearthstone after beginning my employment as the diet tech in July of 2020. And then in October of this past year, I became the first full-time in-house registered dietitian. So I am very excited and very honored to speak to you all today. And again, thank you for having me. <laughs> so National Nutrition Month. This started in 1973 as a week. And then it was expanded to a month long celebration in 1980 due to the growing interest in nutrition. So nutrition is still a relatively new field that people are, I think, gaining more and more interest in. Um, as a kind of addendum to medicine that we are very familiar and comfortable with. So the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is the world's largest organization of food and nutrition professionals. They are committed to improving the nation's health and advancing the profession of dietetics through research, education, and advocacy. And they are the organization who puts on National Nutrition Month. So the theme for this month, the National Nutrition Month of 2021 is personalize your plate. It promotes creating nutritious meals to meet individuals' cultural and personal food preferences at every stage of your life. The Academy encourages everyone to make informed food choices by sitting through webinars such as this where you receive that nutrition education. 
and develop sustainable eating and physical activity habits. So the idea is that by receiving this education, gaining that knowledge, you're able to practice and implement nutrition decisions that are not necessarily going to be like a fad diet where you would adopt it, see whatever results you're going after, and then fall back to other previous habits that kind of suggest that was not a sustainable adoption. The goal is that you adopt sustainable lifestyle changes and kind of support and promote this ongoing healthful eating habit and pattern. And always remember that nutrition is personal. It's, it's very common for us to broadcast general recommendations, which are still appropriate, but at the end of the day, you'll always be eating and making nutrition and health decisions for yourself. It's very individualized. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about nutrition is that it is personal. So if we go back to the plate, there was some stuff that came before then that kind of structured the way that we eat and the feeding patterns that were recommended for us. So what we use now is my plate. And before that, you all might be more familiar with the pyramid. So the food pyramid, and that was kind of a hierarchical design of various food groups. And, you know, the top versus the bottom, what you're supposed to eat more or less of. That only came around in 1992. And before that, in 1916 to the 1930s, that was kind of the, per the first presentation of recommendations about what to think about when you're creating your meals and, and designing your, your, your food for your family, for yourself. That's when it first began that we would, we would think about what are we putting on our plate? So if we jump ahead to my plate, which is where we are now, that didn't come until very recently. It was introduced alongside the update of the USDA food patterns with the 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans. So very recent. It was a different shape from the pyramid. As you can see, it resembles a plate. And it is an icon that was intended to serve as a reminder for healthy eating. So you can visualize what your plate looks like. It was a visual link or cue to food with familiarity for consumers. So although different cultures and customs have different ways of serving their meals, eating their meals, this was what was felt to be a good general visualization and connection between what it means to design a meal. And it continues to be personalized. So remember, nutrition is personal. The my part of my plate, that means, although these are general broad recommendations, at the end of the day, it is gonna be personal to you. So the Academy recommends that you eat right with my plate and you can start simple. So they encourage you to find your 2020, 2025 dietary personal eating routine using the recommendations. You can start simple with my plate by making small changes and informed choices to make healthy decisions that are sustainable. So again, we want you to adopt helpful eating patterns that are, are not gonna be so drastic that you, you can't keep up with it. We want to make small changes, bits at a time that are easy to incorporate into your routine um, and will make you feel good and, and feel excited to incorporate because it's not requiring you to completely change everything all at once. It's just simple, small changes based on the education that you receive. So now we'll kind of go through the my plate. Fruits, it is recommended that you make half your plate fruits and vegetables, and you can focus on whole fruits. You can use fresh or frozen. I think a lot of people have the idea that frozen fruits and veggies aren't as good as fresh, but they are perfectly nutritious. 
um, and oftentimes much more convenient um, depending on what you're able to get from your grocery store, um, how much you can afford to buy in advance and store. Um, so it really is a great option. You can also opt for dried or canned fruits. And if you are getting canned fruits, it's recommended that you look for canned fruits in 100% juice. So try not to focus on the ones with syrup because that's a little bit of extra sugar that is not from the natural fruit. If you can get it in 100% juice, then that's the natural fruit juice. Next up is vegetables. And along with half your plate fruits and veggies, you want to vary your vegetables. And what I like to encourage people is to get as many colors on their plate as possible. So the more colorful your plate, the more vitamins and minerals you're incorporating. Again, you can do fresh or frozen or canned. And when you're opting for canned vegetables, if you can find the ones on the label that says either low sodium or no added salt, that is gonna be a, an excellent way to minimize the amount of added sodium or added salt in your diet. Oftentimes we find that canned products, whether it's a vegetable or a soup, they add a lot of extra sodium and it's, it's quite a bit in that small little can. So that's definitely a good place to be mindful of any added sodium that oftentimes sneaks in there. And there are so many different ways to prepare your veggies. Um, you can steam, saute, roast, or even enjoy raw. So the options are limitless. And when it comes to grains, you want to try and make half of your grains whole grains. So again, if you look on the ingredient list, um, either on a bag of bread or on a box of crackers, if you can find whole grains listed first in that ingredients list, that's awesome. You want to vary your grains as well. So whole grains include oatmeal, popcorn, teff, quinoa, millet, bulgur, brown rice, or breads, crackers, and noodles made with whole grain flours. So there are a ton of grains out there that are considered whole grains. And what that basically means is it's not processed in a way that removes all of the bran and the fiber. So you still get the excellent fiber, you get all of those excellent vitamins and minerals inside the grain before it's processed and removed. And with that, it is recommended that you limit your grain desserts and snacks, and that includes cakes, cookies, and pastries. So remember, this is not saying completely cut out your, your favorite cookie or completely remove cakes out of your, your weekly treat. It's just saying limit and, and look for other ways to incorporate grains throughout your meals instead of completely cutting it out. Next, we have protein. And again, you'll see that theme, vary your protein routine. So vary, look for different sources of protein. You can incorporate additional protein foods, including seafood, beans, peas, and lentils, unsalted nuts and seeds, soy products, eggs, and lean meats and poultry. You can also try going meatless. So try a meatless meal made with beans and have fish or seafood twice a week. I think more and more we see the plant-based approach um, becoming popularized. And it's for good reason because it is an excellent way to get plant-based protein um, and adding that variety of the protein to your diet. And it's quite tasty. <laughs> Next, we have dairy. So it is recommended that you transition to low fat or fat-free dairy milk or yogurt. You can choose fat-free milk, yogurt, and calcium-fortified soy milk to reduce the saturated fat intake. And I'll speak a little bit more about saturated fat in a bit. You can replace sour cream, cream, and regular cheese with low-fat or fat-free yogurt, milk, and cheese. It is recommended that you limit 
added salt, added sugars, and saturated fat. So I talked a little bit about those added salts in canned products, soups, veggies, a lot of processed foods also you'll, you'll notice have higher sodium. Um, and usually that's because of various things that are added to make it more shelf stable. Uh, added sugars, again, I kind of hinted at that with the example of the canned fruits. So if you get canned fruits that are in 100% juice, that has less of that added sugar than if you've had fruits canned in syrup. Uh, for example. Same thing if you were to get preserves or a jam, oftentimes those have added sugar and you can certainly find ones without added sugar that are simply the fruit. So that's a good way to limit that added sugar. It is also recommended that you choose vegetable oils instead of butter and oil-based sauces. So if you select an oil-based salad dressing, that would be an excellent choice. And you can limit the ones that use butter, cream, or cheese as kind of their base. It's also recommended that you drink water in place of sugar-sweetened beverages. So limit the amount of sodas that you're drinking um, and, and opt for water in those cases. Oils are not necessarily part of the plate, but they are an important part of your meal. And I, I kind of touched on that earlier where it's recommending that you opt for vegetable oils instead of butters. Um, and that's because the oils provide those healthy unsaturated fats. And I'll go into that a bit more when we talk about the Mediterranean diet. So let's move on to the purposeful plate. As you know, Unidyne is our wonderful culinary contractor and their take on the National Nutrition Month theme is a purposeful plate. And they encourage individuals to discover, appreciate and enrich the purpose of what they're putting on their plates. So our food choices are intentional and significant. Whenever we shop, cook, eat, snack, dine out, or gather around food, we cultivate the health and well being of ourselves and our environment. And I love the way that they put that because it's so true. We often, I mean, I think in COVID it's a little bit different, but we often gather around food, or food is often the center of gatherings, whether it's a celebration, whether it's a time for mourning, food kind of brings us all together. So the purposeful plate topic of this week, the final week of National Nutrition Month is anti-inflammatory nutrition. And as nutrition education theme for this week, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Mediterranean diet. So anti-inflammatory nutrition. Chronic inflammation has been linked to chronic disease, including heart disease and diabetes, as well as other diseases such as cancer, arthritis, depression, and Alzheimer's. Adopting an overall healthful eating pattern can help fight inflammation. And this is where we see the Mediterranean diet come into play. So the principles of the Mediterranean diet, which is high in fruits, vegetables, nuts, whole grains, fish, and healthy oils, have been studied and show positive health outcomes. So this is one of those diets that is not necessarily a fad diet. So this is more of a lifestyle adoption. Unfortunately, I think the, the word diet or the title of diet has adopted that stigma of a fad diet where it's something that you try out for a little bit, go after whatever your goal is. And then once you've reached that goal, you stop the diet. The Mediterranean diet is more of a lifestyle and an eating pattern. So in addition to lowering inflammation, a more natural, less processed diet can positively impact physical and emotional health. So interest in the Mediterranean diet began in the 1960s, and that was with the observation that coronary artery disease caused fewer deaths in the Mediterranean rather than or compared with the US and Northern Europe. 
Additional studies found that the Mediterranean diet is associated with reduced risk factors of cardiovascular or heart disease. The Mediterranean diet is actually one of the healthy eating plans recommended by the Dietary Guidelines for Americans to promote health and prevent chronic disease. And it is also recognized by the World Health Organization as a healthy and sustainable dietary pattern and as an intangible cultural asset by the United National Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. So again, we hear that word sustainable. Whenever we try and think about a healthy lifestyle pattern or something that we want to adopt and incorporate to live a more healthful life, we look for that sustainable. So principles of the Mediterranean diet. It is an eating pattern, not a structured diet. And it is based on the traditional cuisine of countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea. It emphasizes eating fruits, veggies, whole grains, beans, nuts, legumes, olive oil, and flavorful herbs and spices daily. Now, does that sound similar to my plate? I think so. <laughs> It emphasizes fish and seafood consumed on a weekly basis, poultry, eggs, cheese, and yogurt in moderation, and saving sweets and red meat for special occasions. It also recommends that you stay physically active, share meals with friends and family. And I think oftentimes we, we think of the Mediterranean diet and we think of the recommendation for red wine or the benefits with that. And that is one of those things where it wouldn't be recommended for you to start drinking red wine if you never drank red wine before. Um, but there have been studies that have shown the benefit of having a glass of red wine with your meal, which is what that is very consistent with the way that they eat in the Mediterranean. So if we think about the Mediterranean diet, it is mostly plant-based eating. So again, it centers around the vegetables, the fruits, herbs, nuts, beans, and legumes, and whole grains. After that, moderate amounts of dairy, poultry, and eggs support that plant-based eating, as well as seafood. And red meat is only eaten occasionally. So back to our healthy fats. Healthy fats are prioritized in the Mediterranean diet. So they are eaten in place of less healthy fats, such as saturated and trans fats, which can contribute to heart disease. Olive oil is the primary source of added fat in the Mediterranean diet, and olive oil provides monounsaturated fat. That kind of fat has been shown to lower total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol levels, and LDL cholesterol is sometimes considered the bad cholesterol. Nuts and seeds are another really great source for that monounsaturated fat. Fish are also important in the Mediterranean diet and fatty fish such as mackerel, herring, sardines, albacore tuna, salmon, and lake trout are high in omega-3 fatty acids, which is a type of polyunsaturated fat that may also help reduce inflammation in the body. Omega-3 fatty acids can also help decrease triglycerides, reduce blood clotting, and they may decrease the risk of stroke and heart failure. So getting started with the Mediterranean diet, you'll see these trends again look quite similar to the MyPlate. Eat more fruits and vegetables, incorporate whole grains, include healthy fats, eat more seafood, reduce the amount of red meat, enjoy some dairy, and spice up your life. So using spices and fresh herbs, that's another great way to limit that amount of added sodium or added salt in your diet while still getting great flavor. And if we think about what the plate, what my plate looks like for older adults, for our population here, Again, you see those same trends across the board. There are certain things that will be specific to that stage in your life. And 
at the end of the day, nutrition is still going to be personal. So these are broad recommendations, but we always want people to eat right for themselves based on their personal conditions, their personal preferences, and cultural preferences as well. So still recommended make half your plates, fruits and vegetables. Try to make half of your grains whole grains. Switch to low fat or fat free milk, yogurt and cheese. Again, vary your protein choices. Limit the sodium, saturated fat and added sugars in your diet. Stay well hydrated. Be mindful of portion sizes. Cook healthfully when you're eating in and order healthfully when you're eating out and be physically active to whatever extent or ability you can and what's safe for you to do. So my question is, what does your plate look like? Everyone's food choices are unique. They are allowed to be personalized and should be respected. Cultural, personal, and individual preferences can be met with nutrition education and the empowerment to make those informed, healthful choices. Developing healthful eating habits doesn't require drastic lifestyle changes. Again, we don't want you to give up the things that you love. We want you to adopt and implement those small changes that can be sustainable. And eating for your stage in life is an important part of meeting your individual needs. And that's what I have for you all today. <laughs> so those are some resources. Um, a lot of this information is accessible through eatright.org. And that is the website for the Academy. They are wonderful at providing handouts and infographics. Um, so anything that you're interested in, addition to what I presented on today, I would be happy to direct you there, as well as find some more information for you myself and, and pass it along. Sophia? Yeah. So um, as far as the, uh, the menu goes that, that we have available to us, yes. um, which everybody realizes is a little different than normal, mm -hmm. But um, so how much input do you have on that? I mean, um, spicy foods, uh, you know, that there are some of us that can't eat spicy foods or, you know, certain kinds of foods. Sure. But I guess we have another choice, but. Yeah, so how we typically go through the week um, in planning the menu in advance, I work with our chef and we, have a template. So if you notice on your week at a glance menu in one of the corners, it'll say what week we're on. And for our facility, we're on a four week cycle. So every four weeks, we kind of go back to the beginning. And so I guess each week is kind of a, a starting place for us. And depending on the different holidays that we're celebrating, we might have a special thing. If something is seasonal, we try and incorporate that into the menu. Um, but I think in general, as far as your question goes with, with spicy foods and things like that, we definitely try to make a, a decision about what the meal looks like based on what most people will be able to enjoy and select and opt for. So I think it's it gets tricky, certainly, trying to provide uh, something for everyone. Um, but that's what we, we work to do. And we try to not make things, I think, overly spicy. We try not to make things too salty. Um, we try and, and explore all of the different avenues of, of a balanced meal throughout the week. Um, and incorporate new dishes. Uh, we have a really great uh, recipe collection. And even though we're on that four week cycle, we try and introduce new things. Um, and I think also gathering the feedback from you all, I know 
we, we keep all of your comment cards and, and all of that feedback and information is really helpful for us when we are coming up with the, the weekly menus. Okay, so I have a suggestion maybe. Sure. So I ordered once it was on the menu and it just sounded so delicious. It was like a <laughs> shrimp Caesar salad. Okay. And I said, oh, that sounds so delicious. I ordered it and the shrimp had been cooked in, in something very spicy. Okay. And I could I could not eat it, so I mentioned it to John. But it, only I'm I'm so only suggesting that maybe it be labeled on the sure. menu if okay. it's spicy because okay. some people love spice and some people don't like it or can't eat it. So definitely, uh, yeah, that's I my suggestion. That's, that's a great suggestion, and we've certainly tried to do more of that that indication. So when when things are meatless, including the soups, we we indicate that, and I think. You're, you're right, oftentimes things that don't sound like they'll be spicy, they might turn out a little bit more spicy. So I think that's excellent. I will definitely pass that along. I think that's an important thing. <laughs> and, and I do wanna say, um, I wanna hop in here and say, I'm actually going to stop recording because no one has shared any personal information yet. Um, and I think that we can post this video with no worries. And as I stop recording, you'll be able to kind of share more personal stuff as far as your particular diet questions. So I'm gonna hit stop right now. I'm gonna thank Sophia and she has plenty of time. So um, uh, it was a great presentation and uh, let's, have, let's have the questions start rolling now.